everyone for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our Building a Nuclear Free World talk story series here. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola from the Matsunaga Institute for Peace at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, our talk story today is on the World War II perspectives, the legacy of Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki with David Nakanishi and myself here. Uh, thank you for joining us today to learn about the tragic impact of nuclear bombs. Uh, the talk story is a part of a Building a Nuclear Free World exhibit that was available at the Hamilton Library Bridge Gallery at the University of Hawaii Manila uh, that was available between March and April of this year um, that had, was hosted by both us at the Matsuna Institute, the National Nagasaki Memorial Hall, for the atomic bomb victims and the Hiroshima Atomic Bomb Museum with the continuous threat of nuclear devastation around the world. Learning about and working to build a nuclear free world has never been timelier. Uh, building a nuclear free world does continue the Matsuna Institute's long engagement with public outreach on the nuclear threat beginning in 1985 for the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We mounted an exhibit which uh, traveled around the UH system 50 years of the bomb. Since then, the exhibit has been updated and mounted uh, back in 2018 and in 2020. And the one that just came out is actually a new exhibit. Although the exhibit is now ended, we do encourage you to continue our Beyond the Exhibit that is available uh, at our beacon. And I'll be putting that link in the chat and also available later on in the summary of the YouTube channel, uh, an opportunity to hear about past presentations and uh, how nuclear proliferation our nuclear bombs have impacted the world beyond uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, thank you for joining us as we embark on a journey to build historical empathy. Uh, David Nakanishi, who's a social studies teacher, uh, as well as is in our graduate certificate in conflict resolution right here at the Matsuna Institute, uh, will share his findings as he researched and interviewed the different ways in that Pearl Harbor National Memorial, the Nagasaki Tom Bomb Museum and Peace Park and the Hiroshima National Memorial Hall for the Atomic Bomb Victims represent the events of World War II. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. I got to start. I'm going to turn it over to our good old friend, David. Thank you so much, Jose. And thank you very much to everyone here for joining us uh, this, this evening. I wanted to kind of start my talk story by a little, uh, introducing a little bit about the project itself and um, some of the context for which uh, we will be taking a look at our my video essay that was produced for this project. So I'm going to ask Mr. Barzola to share his screen. He's going to be um, putting up some slides for us. But I would, would again like to thank everyone for being here. Um, I'm really excited to share this, uh, this project with you all. Um, it was very, if I could speak personally, it was a very amazing opportunity for me to kind of develop skills around video editing, but also how to then present information. Uh, so the title of the video itself is going to be World War II Perspectives, and it's a legacy of Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. Um, Jose, could you go to the next slide, please? So I just wanted to kind of briefly go over, there are four really key chapters of um, this project that I wanted to explain here. The first is just a very quick overview of the project and some priming. There's a quick pre-assessment questions. Um, I, based on the number of people here, I don't think we're going to go through a, a Google form. Um, I was just thinking maybe we can have a quick chat. Uh, and then I wanted to explain a little bit more about the methodology of the project itself and then present the culminating project. And after we watch the culminating project, which is um, a video that is about 20 minutes, I'm hoping to have a discussion and go through some reflection questions uh, with you. So, um, Jose, if you don't mind heading to our first slide. So the first part here is going to be the overview. Thank you, Jose. So I do want to say that this project was inspired by Dr. Brian Hallett. Um, unfortunately, he's not here, but he did encourage me to reimagine my original project proposal, which was to develop a video essay. But instead of talking about the monuments, the Pearl Harbor National, Me National Memorial, the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park, as well as the uh, Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, and the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum, and the Nagasaki Peace Park. Um, he, I, I originally had an idea of collecting the curriculum from the different places or different schools here in Hawaii, and several schools uh, or in Japan, and providing a video analysis of the curriculum in these respective cities. Unfortunately, with the, that project, uh, the scope of the project was a little too big for the turnaround time in this, this semester 
um, class. And going through information from the different cities in Japan is actually, we found, or I found out very quickly um, in the beginning of this project uh, that the information from these different cities are tremendously different because uh, these cities in Japan essentially get to decide on the curriculum themselves. And so each city could have their own textbooks and information. Uh, well, here in Hawaii, um, it's a little bit more standard. We have uh, content standards that are um, not necessarily mandated. It depends on the school itself, but the state, uh, the Department of Education does have these set content standards at each grade level. And so the teachers generally have um, the same kind of content that they go over as they teach uh, World War II history. But um, through talking with Dr. Hallett, he encouraged me to then reimagine this project. So the project itself now captures the video or it's a video essay that captures the experience of visiting these different memorials. So again, the Pearl Harbor National Memorial, the Hiroshima Peace Park and Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum and the Nagasaki Peace Park and Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum. Before we get too far too, I also wanted to acknowledge that throughout the research, one of the, uh, the things that I, I learned through this is that the peace uh, or the Hiroshima Peace Park is a separate entity from the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. And same with the Nagasaki Peace Park and the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum. So they're uh, still, they are managed and operated by separate governing uh, uh, organizations, but they are still the, uh, they're still kind of owned by their respective cities. So it was kind of interesting to go through this project and understand that although these um, institutions work very closely with each other, they're not necessarily able to comment on the work of each other because they are um, uh, technically um, separate entities. So um, it, was, it was very interesting to collect some of this information. I'm excited to share that with you. Uh, the purpose of this research was to gather these perspectives from the national monuments because these are largely the uh, the ways in which the different places communicate the perspectives of World War II. And so the Hiroshima Peace Park and the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, as well as the Nagasaki Peace Park and Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum and the Pearl Harbor National Memorial, they see millions of visitors every year. And so it's one of the largest or one of the, um, the most common ways of communicating World War II history is through visiting these sites. And so the hope of this research is then to evaluate the efficacy of this communication between these institutions and their visitors. An integral part of positive peace is nuclear nonproliferation. And I'm hoping that through this project, I can share the ways in which these monuments communicate the story of World War II, history, uh, World War II and its history and how that is represented in their um, monuments and museums. And I'm wondering how that then can affect the way that respective visitors can understand those parts of history. So I hope to share this video with you. Uh, and I also hope to share it eventually with the respective staff members of these monuments so they can also better understand how World War II history is being communicated um, internationally. Um, Jose, do you mind heading to the next slide, please? So I wanted to start with this quick, uh, quick pre-assessment, and I'm hoping that some of us feel confident and comfortable uh, with adding some um, things to the chat. The question that I would like you to um, add to the chat, but if you're not comfortable, uh, please do not feel pressured right now. But I'm wondering if you can at least start to think about what do you think the purpose of historical monuments such as Pearl Harbor National Memorial, um, what is the purpose of these monuments and what are they trying to communicate? Kate. So I want you to just think about that. If you are feeling brave enough and courageous enough, I would love to see some thoughts in the chat. But if not, we're going to move forward um, with the second question, which was, can peace be taught? And if so, how? Um, through these memorials, one of the underlying themes that we see in the missions is the calling for peace and uh, the calling for future peace. And how can we exhibit peace? And how can we um, look and realize future peace? So I'm wondering then if those are the underlying missions and visions, the question or the essential question of this project is really how do these places communicate peace? So I know I just spoke for a really, really long time, but I'm hoping if anybody feels confident um, and comfortable, they can add something to the chat. Uh, if not, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on. As a teacher, I'm <laughs> quite uh, familiar with 
the Zoom silence when we first started he, uh, teaching um, teaching virtually, it was always kind of this this like uh, no man's land of when do when do teachers continue on? How do we uh, understand the Zoom silence? So uh, we've kind of developed uh, this practice of kind of you know talking through our thinking in order to kind of stall to provide space for people to answer. All right, thank you so much, Tutu. I really appreciate that. I also just want to let the audience know uh, if you happen to be, for whatever reason, on a device where the chat is a little complicated, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you are able to do so. And uh, you can also just share some words that way as well. Absolutely. Memorials are, remember, um, are to remember the events that take place. Yes, and we definitely want to learn about the, these events here and peace. I believe I agree with that. Yeah, that peace can be taught through perspectives and beginning discourse. And I'm, I'm really hoping that through this project, we can begin a discourse around what information is presented. Well, thank you very much, Tutu. I'm hoping that we can have a further discussion afterwards. Um, Jose, if you don't mind. Oh, Mia, thank you so much. All right. Peace can be taught more clearly through these memorials by giving visitors as close to a firsthand experience as possible so that they can understand the events. Very, very true, right? We want to provide them with as accurate of these first-hand experiences as possible to really allow visitors to build what we call historical empathy, I think. Um, and that's a concept that we teach in uh, social studies classes. Um, it's built around the Stanford History Education Group's philosophy of uh, reading like a historian. And the idea behind historical empathy is um, by taking a look at history, we need to understand that we cannot judge history by modern norms and seeing historical events and historical eras in the light of the context that it's, it sits within. All right, thank you very much to everyone who is contributing here. I really like to continue to think about these as we uh, watch the video and hopefully we can have a further discussion afterwards about the, uh, the ways in which these monuments communicate peace. Jose, would you mind heading or uh, um, taking us to the next slide, please? Yes, I just uh, in case you missed that last one, there was also a comment about yes, peace can be taught with nonviolent communication, multifaceted yes. storytelling, navigational leadership, uh, your work to build empathy and reduce us uh, them us dash them dichotomies is so important. So just absolutely throw that out there as well. But yeah, next slide methodology. Yep, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about the methodology here. Methodology. So I do want to preface this by explaining that through the course of this project, I immediately understood, I immediately realized that there's so much information to capture here. And we could have an entire years long course going through some of this information. And so it's really, I think it is impossible to, uh, to synthesize this information and water it down to a 20 minute video. Um, and when I was initially creating the, the video project, I did want to try to keep it between uh, 10 and 15 minutes in order to capture or at least keep people's attention, especially if the point was to send this out to different um, places, uh, to the different monuments, because the shareability of the information is equally as important in the content of that information in this case. Um, so the information that you'll see in this uh, this video is definitely not going to tell us the entire story of that. And so um, understanding, I think, reflecting on the methodology of this research, um, I would want to, if I could repeat this project, I would definitely want to separate these ideas into, I think, a format that communicates information more efficiently. So that could just be an article. It could be, uh, it could be maybe some, uh, uh, I'm thinking interactive maps where people can click through different links. Um, unfortunately, the video can only capture um, information at one time. And that was uh, something that was a barrier, I think, to I think the overall um, impact of this project. However, I do want to say the information gathered for this project involved individual research and asynchronous interviews via short response questionnaires. I'd reached out to staff members and experts from the different national monuments with set lists of questions that elicited responses about their missions, 
is their funding, their curating protocols, and other data about the institutions themselves. And so this information was then corroborated with the photographs and videos collected from the visit um, or my visits to each location, along with the publicly available information that can be found on their respective official sources um, for these institutions. So again, um, going through this information, one of the things that came up clearly in the research was the concept of selective presentation. And in these national monuments, they are clearly selecting what information they share to the, the audience. And I was hoping that through this project, I would then share how these places are selectively presenting that information. And I hope, I, I believe, I truly believe that my project still achieved that goal. But the irony is that in creating only a 20 minute video, I'm also selecting and presenting uh, certain information. So that was the irony of the research that I, I noted early on. And so that was one of my early reflections. So in terms of the scope of this project, the information I evaluated in this project barely scrapes the surface of these historical perspectives. And it's no secret that more in-depth uh, research can improve upon this project. All right, thank you, Jose, if you don't mind moving on. So with that context, I'm hoping that we can watch this video. Um, because it is being presented over Zoom, the audio might not come out very clearly. So if you don't mind um, bearing with us as Jose and I try to get this set up for you. Um, but it might be helpful if you could listen through headphones, if that is available to you. If not, um, we should still be able to communicate uh, some of this information. Yeah, sorry, Jose. It looks like we're still not getting the audio. Sorry, Jose, still not, still nothing. Sorry, everybody about that, um, that, that feedback. Um, and sorry, uh, Jose, I just, I just muted you for the, the feedback loop that we were receiving. Um, I'm wondering if, um, if Jose, if maybe we can try for my computer instead. And thank you everybody for your patience as we sort through some of the technical difficulties of this project. When we were testing earlier, uh, we did have trouble with the audio coming from my computer as well. So um, I'm gonna try to share my screen too. Um, I'm hoping, and maybe Jose can give me a, um, a thumbs up if the information is coming through. According to Stanford University, 
there are several axioms of historical thinking. First, history is an account of the past. Accounts differ depending on one's perspective. We rely on evidence to construct accounts of the past. We must question the reliability of each piece of evidence, and any single piece of evidence is insufficient to build a plausible account. These key ideas pose a critical question. How do we teach history? Considered perhaps the first historian is a Greek writer named Herodotus. He is widely known for his writings about the ancient Greeks and for documenting the epics of the Trojan War. He was later nicknamed the father of history since he is responsible for much of the history we know about ancient Greece. Yet even this idea is controversial. Was Herodotus really the first historian? Faustino Mora from Brown University can be quoted. He is remembered as being arguably the first historian ever. But this leaves room for interpretation and analysis. Herodotus's teachings are accessible, and one could argue that the accessibility of his writings in the absence of others is not indicative of the entire truth. Around the world stand structures of human intelligence, culture, beliefs, and ingenuity. Yet these structures are merely reflections of the respective values of these societies and does not provide historian with all perspectives. As evident in the opening sequence of this very video, the presentation of specific perspectives in history can evoke certain emotions, but that doesn't necessarily capture the entire truth. The perspectives of World War II and the use of the atomic bombs can be emotionally charged topics. So how does Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Hawaii portray history? And what does each place teach the public about peace? The Pearl Harbor National Memorial is located in Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam on Oahu in the state of Hawaii. Its establishment was approved by President Dwight Eisenhower in 1958 and the construction completed in 1962. Management was originally the responsibility of the U.S. Navy. In 1980, these responsibilities were turned over to the National Park Service. 28 years later, an executive order passed on December 5th of 2008 to establish the World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monument, which directed the National Park Service to manage the USS Arizona Memorial, USS Utah, and USS Oklahoma Memorials, six officer bungalows, and three mooring caves, part of Battleship Row. Most recently, in 2019, the National Park Service redesignated the World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monument to the Pearl Harbor Memorial. According to the National Park Service, the Pearl Harbor National Memorial and its partners preserve, interpret, and commemorate the history of World War II in the Pacific from the events leading to the December 7, 1941 attack on Oahu to peace and reconciliation. Perhaps the most well-known destination at the Pearl Harbor National Memorial is the USS Arizona Memorial, which is built over the sunken remains of the USS Arizona battleship. It is also the resting place for many of the 1,177 crewmen killed on December 7, 1941, when the ship was bombed by Japanese naval forces. According to Pacific Historic Sites, this loss represents over half of Americans killed during the worst naval disaster in American history. The Arizona Memorial sits atop the sunken hull of the USS Arizona. It rises 21 feet high as its gleaming white frame sharply contrasts the blue water of Pearl Harbor. Visitors must take a ferry to the memorial and enter through a darkened hall to emerge onto a sunlit deck. Visitors can see both the bow and stern of the ship, while an opening towards the west end of the memorial provides another view to more of the sunken vessel. Finally, at the end of the memorial is a wall of marble stone listing the names of the 1,177 men who were killed during the bombing of Pearl Harbor on the USS Arizona. The exterior of the memorial is also symbolic. Architect Alfred E. Price, once interned on Sand Island, explains how the sagging of the structure expresses the initial defeat and ultimate victory, while the holes in the wall of the memorial represents the damage of the attack. The Pearl Harbor National Memorial also features a number of additional exhibits that highlight the U.S. military's technological advancements throughout the decades during World War II and through the rest of the 20th and early 21st century. The USS Bofin is open to visitors and allows one to even enter the ship. Following the interpretive themes identified by the National Park Service, the memorials constitute places of remembrance 
and contemplation of the nature of war and the sacrifices of those who lost their lives during the Pacific War. While another emerging theme is also notable, the world is still struggling to find meaning of trust, respect, and peace for the future. The essential question then is, does the Pearl Harbor National Memorial accomplish this? On August 6, 1945, an American B-29 bomber dropped the first atomic bomb in human warfare over the city of Hiroshima, where it detonated with a ferocious blast that killed the inhabitants of the city. Today, the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum now sits a few hundred meters from the hypocenter of the atomic bomb that exploded in 1945 in the city of Hiroshima and the Hiroshima Prefecture. In 1949, the Bill of the Peace Memorial City Construction Law is passed, allowing Hiroshima City to be rebuilt as a city symbolizing the pursuit of lasting world peace. And two years later, in 1951, the construction of the Peace Memorial Museum begins. Over the next 70 years, the museum has went through its share of renovations, including to both the main and the east buildings. The purpose of the establishment of this museum is defined in Article 1 of the Ordinance of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, which says, Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum shall be established to convey to the world actual facts of the atomic bombing and to contribute to the abolition of nuclear weapons and the realization of lasting world peace. Today, the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum is owned by the city of Hiroshima, but is managed and operated by the Hiroshima Peace and Culture Foundation. These entities take great steps in order to uphold the high standards of the museum content. For example, the museum curators must hold a national certificate and items must be authenticated through these museum curators. The museum is separated into two distinct sections, the main building featuring artifacts and belongings of the atomic bomb victims and the East Building, featuring the history of Hiroshima and the dangers of nuclear weapons. The Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum sits within the larger Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park, which also features the symbolic A-bomb dome, a building that survived the initial blast of the atomic bomb. The Children's Peace Monument, a statue erected to mourn all of the children who died from the atomic bombing and the flame of peace. The pedestal of the flame of peace was designed to suggest two hands pressed together at the wrist and bent back so that the palms point up to the sky. It expresses condolence for the victims unable to satisfy their thirst for water, as well as the desire for nuclear abolition and enduring world peace. The flame has burned continuously since it was lit on August 1st, 1964. It symbolizes the anti-nuclear resolve to burn the flame until the day when all such weapons shall have disappeared from the earth. The city of Hiroshima notes 57 different monuments and locations in the Peace Memorial Park, which cannot all be captured here, but more information can be found by visiting the city of Hiroshima's website. Many of these locations feature additional artifacts or monuments dedicated to atomic bomb victims or symbolize peace. These monuments and locations tell the story of the atomic bombing. So, does the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum convey to the world actual facts of the atomic bombing and contribute to the abolition of nuclear weapons and the realization of lasting world peace? This question, along with others, would require further research and surveying. On the morning of August 9, 1945, the city of Nagasaki would be devastated by a second atomic bomb dropped by the United States. A few years later, the city and its citizens would vote on a law that would determine how the city would be built. According to the Nagasaki National Peace Memorial Hall for the atomic bomb victims, the city of Nagasaki passed the Nagasaki International Culture City Construction Law in 1949 which allowed the city to focus on redevelopment of the city to become an international city of peace and culture. Part of this plan dedicated the area around the hypocenter of the atomic bomb to the construction of the Nagasaki Peace Park, the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum, and the Nagasaki International Culture Hall. One of the iconic monuments of the Nagasaki Peace Park is the Peace Statue, 
which was completed in 1955 with funds raised from all over the world. The sculptor, Kitamura Sebo, wrote a poem to commemorate the peace statue's completion. In the poem, he explains how the peace statue rises here as a pioneer in the worldwide movement for peace. Sitting across from the Nagasaki Peace Park is the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum and the National Peace Memorial Hall for the atomic bomb victims of Nagasaki. The mission of the museum is to research, collect, preserve, and exhibit artifacts related to the atomic bombing and peace, offer a space to conduct peace education programs aimed at passing on the experience of the atomic bombings and meetings to discuss about peace, conduct surveys and research that contributes to promoting peace and others that are deemed necessary by the mayor of Nagasaki. Much like the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum has a rather thorough protocol for curated items for display. Items must be authenticated by a team before it can enter the museum's exhibits. Next to the museum is the Remembrance Hall, which features a number of carefully carved fountains that surround a symbolic light feature. According to the Atomic Bomb Museum, on the surface level, a sculpted basin 29 meters in diameter was installed. When night falls, some 70,000 fibers of light radiate from it, signifying the number of victims who died as a result of the atomic bombing. In addition to the iconic peace statue and remembrance hall, the Nagasaki Peace Park features several different pieces of art that have symbolic meaning. For example, the Nagasaki Peace Fountain squirts water up to 6 meters and forms a pattern of a dove of peace. Other pieces of art can be found throughout the rest of the park and also feature a recurring theme, the calling for peace. There are too many pieces to cover for this video here, but more information can be found on the Nagasaki City's website. As with the other national monuments, the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum and Peace Park tell a perspective of World War II and nuclear weapons. So, do these monuments, artifacts, and sculptures exhibit the atomic bombings and peace? As discussed earlier in the video, the presentation of certain perspectives of history can communicate different ideas. While each monument allows for guided tours, there is no preset route a visitor must take to visit each museum. While some exhibits are intentionally designed in a way that the natural path tells a story, all three locations still allow visitors to go out of order to explore. Having visited these locations, I noticed a few different themes. First, the Pearl Harbor National Monument features many more instruments of military technology than the Japanese National Monuments. The ferry ride to the Arizona Memorial is preceded by a serious and solemn explanation of the gravity of the memorial, but the tour itself features less of a focus on peace than it does on the horrors of war. In contrast, however, there are celebrations of military victories. For example, many of the artifacts on display are of torpedoes and guns. There is a section of the museum where visitors can find the memorials of U.S. vessels from World War II. On these memorials are plaques telling a brief history of the vessel. Upon closer inspection, many of these summaries focus on the victories at war, such as how many enemy ships were destroyed by the vessel and her crew. While for Americans, this may instill a sense of pride, I fail to see how this perspective exemplifies peace. The Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum does stay true to its mission. Much of the imagery in the museum is poignant and charged with emotion. In fact, reflecting on this experience, the lack of footage I took from the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum is a testament to my personal bias towards the content, that the museum conveys the egregious consequences of nuclear weapons through graphic imagery of the bomb's aftermath, imagery that is too graphic for me to share openly. In a way, this proves to me that the museum does convey to the world actual facts of the atomic bombing and contributes to the abolition of nuclear weapons and the realization of lasting world peace through the explicit use of this emotionally charged imagery. Most interestingly to me is the mission of the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum. The mission is quite simple. Research, collect, preserve, and exhibit artifacts related to the atomic bombing and peace. While I believe they are obviously achieving their mission through the collection of artifacts from A-bomb survivors, I'm still captivated by the abstract nature of the museum itself. Unlike the other two national memorials, the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum and Peace Park feature more abstract art fixtures that tell stories. To me, these sculptures are very beautiful and thought-provoking, 
but a limitation I notice is the accessibility to the historical facts. The Peace Park... In the end, the perspectives of these national monuments individually and when analyzed together exist to necessitate the axioms of historical thinking. History is an account of the past. Accounts differ depending on one's perspective. We rely on evidence to construct accounts of the past. We must question the reliability of each piece of evidence. And finally, any single piece of evidence is insufficient to build a plausible account. To conclude, I would like to return back to the essential questions of this video. How does Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Hawaii portray history? And what does each place teach the public about peace? All three of these national monuments capture dark moments in human history and the unimaginable suffering and loss of life. They communicate very different moments in history that all fall under the same story of World War II. The artifacts of each respective monument in aggregate tell us the story, but only we as the interpreter create meaning. So, what did these monuments teach you about history? Well, thank you everybody uh, for <laughs> bearing with me as we kind of figured out some of the uh, technical issues with um, presenting that information. I hope since I wasn't able to kind of necessarily hear how the audio was on your end, I'm hoping that you were still able to um, understand a lot of the information from um, the video as well as um, hearing a lot of the, the music as well since as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> a huge part of this, uh, the irony I guess of the, this work is that there is a level of selective presentation and how I communicated um, this information to you. So I'm hoping that this can kind of lead us into a discussion. Um, I have a few more questions for us to um, to think about. Um, if, uh, Jose, if you could share the screen again, we can finish with our uh, discussion and reflection questions. <laughs>
Hmm. Sorry, some technical difficulties at this end here. No, thank you so much for helping um, present this for me, Jose. I really appreciate all the reflection. I've seen that there are some questions in the chat. I'm looking at them now. Thank you for engaging uh, in the video itself and um, asking some questions to help kind of spark some of the dialogue here. Um, I'm looking at uh, Dr. Sori Tarling's question here. Are there any, are, are there particular exhibit pieces that you think are particularly important in teaching and engaging visitors and students, especially in dialogue and solid um, solutionary peace building? Wow, really great question. Um, I think if I were to, I guess, I don't know what the best verb here, <laughs> I apologize if I'm, I'm losing um, my thoughts. Um, I think the, I guess marquee, <laughs> maybe that's definitely not the, the best word to describe this, but uh, the more iconic um, USS Arizona Memorial um, at Pearl Harbor is, obviously uh, a very emotionally charged place. Um, the National Park Service staff, they do an excellent job of communicating the gravity and the magnitude of the memorial itself before you get on the ferry out to the memorial. And the memorial itself is absolutely powerful and just in the way that it's presented and the natural path that you must take um, in order to see the entire, um, the entirety of the, the monument. And especially when you get into that back room to see the 1,177 names, um, just a, a very, for me, it's a very emotionally charged moment. Um, to speak on a more personal note, there is, a, there is one of my own family members um, that's listed there. So every time I walk in, my, my eyes immediately go to that top section um, where his, his name is. And just, um, so I think in terms of just the, uh, the engaging nature, of seeing such a uh, such a display of, of these a thousand names, I think that's very powerful. Um, in terms of the other museums, the Nagasaki uh, Museum does, or sorry, their Peace Park, there is uh, there is a monument, and the name of it is escaping me, and I apologize that it's escaping me. Um, it is a monument that's just outside of the entrance. Um, and it's across the street from the Atomic Bomb Museum entrance. So it's uh, right across the street and it's a display of um, the, and it, sorry, and this image wasn't uh, captured in the video itself, but it's a, it's a statue of children that are engulfed in flames. Uh, and so it's a very, or the, the nature of the, the the sculpt the statue and sculpture is very grotesque but the idea that's communicated there is just the how horrible the atomic bomb was to the people of the city and especially the children and so that imagery is very very powerful um it's not necessarily captured in a lot of the um the i guess promotional material of the nagasaki Peace Park, um, because the Remembrance Hall imagery is just very abstract and it invokes a sense of serenity. Um, so in that case, it's also very powerful to see. The Remembrance Hall sits atop of that, that basin that you saw in the video itself. Um, I had kind of those panning shots of um, kind of that teal structure. Unfortunately, going into this, this project, I realized the camera that I was using was not great for capturing um, any of the memorials at night. And so I wasn't really able to capture that monument that, um, that, that, in, that you saw in the quote, radiates the 70,000 um, fibers of light. Uh, but that structure itself, um, according to the Nagasaki uh, Peace Memorial Hall for the atomic bomb victims, it sits literally a few hundred meters from the Hypo Center. So it, it was, its uh, location was intentionally constructed there. And I think once you understand the context behind that, that is a very powerful, um, I think, imagery to have because you're the, again, the dichotomy here, you, you are going to the museum and you're seeing these, these, uh, the graphic aftermath of the atomic bomb use um, and just the destruction that it left in Nagasaki. And then you are sitting outside of this, this fountain that has a very beautiful and peaceful um, kind of 
um, atmosphere to it. So I think that is also a very, very powerful uh, place to, to visit. Um, and in, I, I guess finally the Children's Memorial, if I'm specifically thinking about engaging students, the Children's Memorial at the Hiroshima Peace Park, I think also kind of achieves that um, in the way that it's, I think, difficult for, at least in terms of when I teach in history, it's, I think, very difficult for students to uh, develop any historical empathy for these people because they're so far removed from them. But seeing the Children's Memorial and especially seeing um, there's like an intersection, there's a there's a bell in that monument and there's an area where you can kind of see more of the um, the cranes that other children are donating to the museum. You can see how um, how important uh, and significant this event was to Hiroshima uh, City and how many people value looking towards peace um, moving forward. Uh, I'm sorry, I feel like this was a very long-winded <laughs> answer. I'm realizing as a teacher, I kind of like jump into this once we get to like historical content. So I'm actually going to stop talking. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll jump in when we're kind of going through some of these responses. But I, I really want to honor our time here. So I was hoping we can get into the discussion now, which, um, Jose, thank you for being very gracious. Um, please feel free to interrupt me with as I go through uh, these diatribes. Um, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind helping me move on to the discussion questions, there's a first one here. Um, and the, the first question is really, um, it's geared for you as the audience. Uh, I'd like you guys to, or I'm liking the audience to really think about, after we've watched this video, what did these monuments teach you about history, specifically the history of World War II? Um, I'm hoping we can respond in the chat. Uh, but I'm also I am um, just really quickly while uh, folks are kind of mulling over this question and engaging in the ch chat. I do want to recognize some other folks who previously uh, made some comments about, um, uh, you know, we must remember there is no pride in the war um, there. Thank you for sharing the intricacies of these memorials. Uh, someone said that viewing from above, seeing the ship below the surface and the memorial above it grips her heart every time uh, the stark reality. Someone else mentioned about, yes, being able to see the ship below your eyes and clearly picture what happened on the morning of December 7, 1941 is always emotional for them too, especially thinking about how there are still many people who were on their Arizona that morning still trapped inside. Um, and then they suggested to, oh, <laughs> um, someone also referenced the Museum of Holocaust Victim Shoes and Luggage. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, honestly, uh, I have to say thank you so much for all that you've brought to us so far and uh, how engaging this topic is and just, uh, uh, um, but yeah, I, I want to go back to your discussion. What did these monuments teach you about history? I don't know if anyone in the audience, you're also welcome to unmute yourself. Um, or you can add stuff in the chat. <laughs> I will say, um, so David, just uh, as folks are kind of, because I've noticed our community tends to, and very appreciative for their thoughtful reflection. So um, you delved into like three really, you know, areas, kind of pivotal portions of World War II here. Yes. Um, it, normally it's not easy to just process one at a time. And I know you didn't do it like one after the other. It was over like a few months. Um, but it's a lot. It's a lot to process. So um, as you talk about, you know, further research that can be done, you know, you, you mentioned that in your video, you, you, meant, uh, you also kind of spoken about it briefly. Uh, what kind of words of wisdom do you have for folks who want to kind of, you know, they themselves want to go on this journey of, you know, visiting Pearl Harbor Visitor Center, visiting Nagasaki and Hiroshima, um, any guidance on self-care or things to prepare you. It's it's a lot. That's a very great question, Jose. Thank you. Um, I guess to prepare yourself. Would how did be, you prepare yourself? How did I prepare myself? Well, 
in terms of the research, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to work around this answer. In preparation for this research, it wasn't my first time being at any of these locations. Um, when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to visit both um, the Hiroshima Peace Park and uh, the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, as well as the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum and the Nagasaki Peace Park. So it wasn't necessarily my first visit to those places, although I will say that my first visit to those places was very emotional for me. Um, I did not share this in the video, um, but my family does have specific, uh, there's connections to the city of Hiroshima um, and very personal connections there. And so it was very tough being there the, the few times that I have gone um, and knowing how I felt in those times helped me to kind of really have to prepare myself mentally um, going into the museum um, for the third time uh, in order to conduct some of this research. So in terms of what I would say, I don't know if I have specific advice uh, to people, but absolutely to take a look at their websites um, beforehand. There is um, great information already available, especially um, the Hiroshima City's website. They have a section where you can kind of take a pre-guided tour. Um, there are 57 total monuments to visit um, before you go. And some of those monuments I think are important uh, to visit because it does capture a perspective of World War II history that wasn't necessarily captured in this video either, um, for example. And sorry, I know I'm turning this into a separate question, um, but there is, a, um, there is a monument at the Hiroshima Peace Park and I'm, the name of the, the monument is escaping me, but it's a monument to commemorate the victims of the Korean families um, or the Korean people that were affected by the atomic bombing. So in Hiroshima, um, there was about 20 to potentially 40,000 Koreans there. Um, and a part of at least World War II um, curriculum in United States is uh, the neglect or lack of representation of the Koreans that were affected by the atomic bombing. And so again, it's just a, a, a representation of selective presentation. And in terms of the information that was, um, was presented in this pre-guided tour, I feel like it going into the Peace Memorial Park um, will and having an understanding of these are the different monuments um, can really aid one in understanding the gravity of uh, this moment in history, but specifically the multiple perspectives um, of this event and perspectives that are largely missed, I think, in a lot of ed um, education today. Sorry, I, I guess I have having these really long winded responses no no thank you thank you uh our our community has uh provided some comments uh i'll kind of guide it along uh we have someone mentioned that no one person has all the answers many perspectives come to play in the role of peace uh they did have a question do you take this research into the classroom if so what age group that's an uh, excellent question um as a social studies teacher i teach us um so um i teach ancient world history in a middle school uh so there's not necessarily a, a lot of overlap uh, with World War II. Um, and so I don't really touch on that topic specifically. However, the concept of historical empathy, but also perspective gathering is the concept that I bring into a lot of the, the classroom discussions. So for example, um, we've taken a look at different parts of ancient world history, but once we kind of get to a portion where there's specific primary source documents, it's really uh, fun to engage the students in looking at these different perspectives. And so, for example, in our one of our latest um, classes, we had um, a unit about Caesar Augustus. And the general concept was we were providing all of this material um, to the students. We had these kind of like uh, modified uh, primary source documents, but the students got to take a look at different ways that they saw Caesar Augustus. And so the idea here is not necessarily the same as World War II history, but the concept is gathering perspectives so one can build their own um, idea uh, and opinion about these moments in history. And so it's the same, same thing here. You provide 
students with the opportunity to engage in these real world, or sorry, these uh, historical and um, uh, I guess, yeah, real world uh, moments and allow them to then craft their own understanding of the world and of history by giving them access to this, um, to the various perspectives. And I think as a social studies teacher and one where you know, you're looking at ancient world history, um, I'm not claiming to be an expert in World War II history at all. And so going into stuff like this is very important since you understand that the presentation of perspectives can or can and probably will change your opinions and understanding of history. And you just have to have that open-mindedness. And that's another value I share with students is knowing that it's okay for us to not know everything. And even more so, it's okay for us to change our opinion about something. Because as we learn more about these moments in history, we should be developing a more robust and holistic understanding of these events. Thank you. Um... Some additional comments from our audience. Uh, these monuments taught me just how many people were and still are, are affected from these events. I can't imagine how it must feel to have a direct family member who was affected from the aftermath uh, of the nuclear aggression that was used on these days, on these days that are quite monumental um, as they sparked actions by both countries with the US entering World War II after Pearl Harbor was attacked and Japan officially accepting surrender after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, they taught me that the violence, oh, someone else mentioned that, uh, they taught me that the violence of history does not discriminate and that we can find uh, determination in thinking always about the children. The charred bicycle in Hiroshima brings me to tears instantly. Uh, but the resilience demonstrated in the many cranes made by visitors and the poetry of the children who leave words and the quotes about peace and grape into the benches overlooking the water and ground zero, where I always reflect, make me feel determined about the children of the future. Um, and then lastly, um, we forget all cultures are affected, someone mentioned as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just... Uh, Honestly, for myself, what these monuments taught me about history, it's it's um like like a lot of this, it's it's very selective. It's one perspective. Um it, in, in my mind, it's always been like what isn't being represented. And, and you you kind of alluded to a little bit about that. And so um I hope as you know time has gone on, I think um I like to think we're moving in the process where we're uncovering history a little bit more. Although yes, there are, you know, a little bit of pulling left and right and, and some division across the board of uh, books being banned and history being rewritten. But uh, just gotta believe in the human spirit that we are on the right path, especially, I mean, comparing to like, you know, where we were a century ago, at least. So, um, I, I'm not sure if you have additional questions. Uh, uh, do you want me to go on to the next one? I do have additional questions. I do want to be uh, cognizant of the time and I want to um, honor um, everybody for being here. Thank you again very much for to for coming to to join this talk story and to uh, really uh, allow me to present some of this information. I hope that you um, got something out of uh, this this video as well as um, our discussion. Um, there were two more questions I'd like to go, or like to be able yeah, to talk about. Yeah, we can do that. I'm not sure if we have time. I, 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 I have time. Uh, and I, I imagine if folks uh, can't be here, they, they can always catch the recording or they'll join us. So I would say let's just uh, continue on maybe another like 10, 15 minutes and uh, do these national monuments communicate peace. Yeah, so <laughs> to give us context again, um, many of the... Or, these three memorials have some section in their mission or vision about um, protecting peace or realizing peace or finding peace or exhibiting peace. And I, I mean, all of these action verbs are very, I think, intricate in their own way. But I'm wondering at its core, can we, or what ways do we communicate peace? So I guess the context for this question is, do you feel like these national monuments communicate peace? So I'll uh, just to save in the <laughs> me typing. Uh, I don't think so. In all honesty, um, I think they mostly just uh, represent a moment in time. 
honoring a moment in time. Um, may, I mean, it could be argued that there is an opportunity to have a collective gathering uh, and through folks who come, you know, whether they do a pilgrimage or whether they come to pay their respects, uh, there is a bit of honoring the past, which could be perceived as, I guess, peace. Um, I, I, I say no initially just because, um, I mean, when we talk about positive, negative peace, uh, a lot of these monuments are results of, unfortunately, negative peace. Uh, and so, which can be argued, it's a form of peace, but is it the peace that we want to be communicated, I guess? Uh, what One of the things that I've always kind of um, thought when visiting these locations is how important it would be to have some facilitative dialogue after you go through these places. Uh, that's my biggest concern as far as like whether there... You know, most of them, you kind of just give your own tour. You just walk around. And by the end, you come through it with what what is, you know, your uh, your overall reflection on, on this process. Um, I, I worry that without, you know, some facilitated dialogues for folks to talk about it, um, if the intent is to communicate peace, it, it could really go either way um, after that, because um, some of them, it could just barely be like, oh, no, this is very black and white. What was done was atrocious, and I need to hate this other party, uh, you know, as opposed to, like, the reality that life is not black and white. Life is complicated. And uh, understanding all the intricacies, you know, someone talked about, you know, the ending of World War II. Uh, was the atomic bombings. Uh, we mentioned Professor Brian Hallett here, who gives a talk about the, the, the atomic bomb myth and how it actually wasn't the, the atomic bombs that ended World War II. Um, it was the entrance of the Soviet Union into the war that did it. There's a separate talk story that goes into that for folks in the audience. But um, but yeah, so so the opportunity to have that critical thinking, I think is, is so essential in these facilitated dialogues. And the monuments themselves just standing on their own i sometimes worry that they cause more uh harm or danger than uh, help um i don't know some thoughts yeah i wonder, I wonder if i can echo some of that jose because yeah. I, I i agree right i think if if anything these monuments communicate negative peace right the showcasing the horrors of these these acts of violence. Um, but one of the things that really stood out to me, and I mentioned this in the, the final thoughts of this video, but the there's a section of that Pearl Harbor National Memorial, the there's that shot of the flag, um, not of the uh, not on the USS Arizona Memorial, but um towards kind of I guess the the north-ish side of the the memorial. Um, and you kind of go through this spiraling space where you can take a look at the vessels. Um, used in World War II, and you can read information on these plaques, and it's almost as if the plaques, and I, again, I don't know who, who wrote these, but most of the plaques mention this ship sunk this many Japanese vessels, or this, uh, you know, this place, or this ship um, went to this battle against the, the Japanese, and so it, it lists just the, their part in World War II, which again is part of their, their mission, right? Which is to communicate these ideas of World War II and the history of it um, and to commemorate these events. But it almost comes off as a celebration and being there with this, this eye of conducting this research, I was almost kind of shocked to then read it and think, wow, this is actually almost pitting or celebrating the U.S. victory over the Japanese, um, kind of again this we versus them or us versus them mentality. It was almost celebrating that concept, and so there are definitely definitely spaces I felt like at that at the National Pearl Harbor National Memorial that doesn't necessarily capture peace. Um, if anything, it's kind of celebrating the division 
um, you know, not I said this is a division, but celebrating the acts of violence in World War II. Um, and just, yeah, so I think there is, there is space for uh, the museums to absolutely capture um, negative piece. But in, at least in that specific example, it's more about the, the might, the strength of the U.S. military m more than the events of World War II. No, thank you. I uh, and I, I think you brought up a something. I, I mean, I've been to the Pearl Harbor Visitor Center a couple times, and uh, maybe initially I was more impacted by all the artillery and weapons. But it's and it, it maybe that's part of the issue. Like I, after going there so much, kind of become desensitized to it, or you just it, it's part of the process. And um, I mean, it's almost like blinders go up, I guess. Uh, someone in our audience did have a response uh, and mentioned that about how I think about all these monuments, I think all these monuments communicate peace, but some have more of a focus on it than others. I feel like the Hiroshima Memorial in particular does the best job of communicating the magnitude of the event, which is why it is so important to have peace in this world. Uh, however, the communication of peace ultimately comes from the visitors reacting to the content being shared with the added factor of previous knowledge and involvement. Thank you. Thank you so much. That sounds like a very uh, teacher <laughs> response. I'm not sure, <laughs> but absolutely, right? As a social studies teacher, this is kind of uh, one of the facets of um, teaching history, right? We go in and per, like we just want to provide students with as many perspectives of an event as possible. But ultimately, their previous schema on a certain topic uh, will largely drive how they're already thinking about a topic, and then more so the constructivist arguments um, or view of um, education would suggest, right, that we can present them with this information, but ultimately they're constructing their own ideas and own views of these things. So ultimately key, uh, peace in terms, and when we talk about communication is on the part of the listener, where in this case, um, or in, I guess in this case, maybe the viewer um, or visitor, but it's the person experiencing um, visiting these these places, uh, they're the person that can receive, I guess, be the recipient in this communication about what peace is, but it's still largely based on the visitor themselves. We have one more question. Um, I'm not sure again if we, we do have time, but the, the final question is how do you interpret the information from these monuments? And again, the, the context here is just we've, or the video itself presents only, again, small portion of the events, uh, or sorry, of the, the places. I think looking at the Hiroshima part of my own, you know, this, this own video essay, I think I capture less than maybe a third of the actual monuments that are listed in their, their website. Um, and so obviously this video might not be necessarily the best introduction to, um, the the scope of these monuments themselves but the general question here is how do you interpret the information from these monuments so what you were exposed to at least in the video um and so this is more about kind of how my selective presentation of the information what did this or how do you interpret the information that i presented to you so that's another way of thinking about this question um but uh, in general how do you interpret the information from these monuments I mean, I, I, I think we kind of delved into it a little bit with the previous question, or maybe I, I went ahead a little and started talking about uh, how I do interpret it, since I don't think it necessarily communicates peace. I mean, I think there's an interesting conversation around, especially uh, we, we look back at, uh, you know, uh, 2020 and the, with here in the United States with uh, the George Floyd situation and the larger impact of a focus on monuments just in the United States and uh, and a push toward questioning and eventually taking down monuments that we have that, you know, celebrated, um, uh, you know, um, slave owners and other people in history who maybe that's not necessarily the way we want to be remembered or the things that we want around communities um, as things to honor. Um, <clears throat> I, I, so I think that in itself brings up a good question as far as like, 
monuments I feel as though are around to, yes, remember part of history, but simultaneously we are trying to, it, it's a form of modeling. I mean, we, we, we want folks, and, and it's, it's kind of weird that we're, we're choosing monuments for, for our youth to look up to, as opposed to the current folks who are around or, or, or just, you know, it's, 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 piece of rock that's been shaped like someone <laughs> uh, just the, the whole concept i mean if you think about it um um it, it, i mean it's, it's symbolism i guess that's that's the the artistic aspect of it um but, but in this day and age i kind of wonder if it's the best way to go about it i mean i've been to a couple of museums where uh they're engaging with digital media to en engage in so we get away from the monument so it's something that can be constantly updated and uh so i, I think it's one thing to when it's some like a statue that gets created for and then that's what i'm thinking of monuments as opposed to like artifacts from a situation that happened which i think that is something that i think um so i re like walking through the nagasaki atomic bomb museum and you know, the there was a rock that you see the bones. Someone's hand had gotten infused into the rocks because of the, the 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 levels of temperature, the heat from the atomic bombing. I mean, you're really trying to get a point across. I just don't. Or, or there's those um, the steps uh, uh, of a home in Hiroshima where you see the shadow. You know, all, all that's left of the person who is there is the shadow. Um, I think, I don't think of those as like monuments. I think those as like artifacts from history. And that to me is so much more impactful than, you know, building some statue that um, honors someone. Because, you know, history is constantly shifting and we're constantly updating as we learn about certain areas so i don't know but i don't know oh we have someone from our audience <laughs> thank you so much for still being with us uh with, with certain memorial monuments like the one at pearl harbor i interpret the information through experiencing the various visual representations like the ship below your eyes when you stand in arizona memorial monuments the visual representation of pearl harbor are the most clearly communicated to stress the effects and magnitude of the event but the other visual representation at Hiroshima and Nagasaki only have those effects when given context beforehand. I totally agree with the, that comment. Um, the interpretive themes, uh, the monuments are, I think, particularly hard to, to unpiece uh, and unpack um, right from the get-go. I think in the Hiroshima uh, Peace Memorial Park, Specifically, I think the biggest, um, or I think the most relatable, I don't say relatable, that's not the right word to use. Um, the monument, I guess, in this case, that captures that is the atomic bomb um, dome, which you don't have the ability to to go into as a, as a visitor, but you do get to see, and you get to see the effect of the atomic bomb itself. Now, I think what contrasts that with the Pearl Harbor National Memorial is, especially when you you go with the the tour, um, which I guess is not really a tour, but you have to take the ferry. So the National Park Service has a little bit more of an opportunity to guide your own journey through that memorial because they see you beforehand. And when they start off their, either the video presentation or the, the talk that they give you, before you enter the ferry and they just explain to you that you're standing on top of a grave site. Um, that really helps, I think, visitors interpret the magnitude of the event itself. Um, whereas in Nagasaki, and I, I mentioned this in the video itself, uh, obviously they have plaques and the plaques can help you understand the context, but for especially students, um, I don't wanna speak for my students necessarily, but, um, if students are not given the express uh, 
instruction of making sure you read through everything that you see, uh, which again, they still might not do. They'll, they only expose themselves to the, the visual representation, right, of these monuments. And so when you're at Nagasaki, you have these memorial, well, they're more monuments and statues. It's really abstract in a lot of ways. And without the context behind it, which you can still get from um, the plaques and the other readings that they have available to you. But if you're just there to look at the visual representation, it's hard to capture the gravity of uh, the Nagasaki or the, the, the atomic bomb um, over Nagasaki and really the impact um, that it has. So in terms of, again, the, yeah, the information from these monuments, they communicate in very, very different ways. And I think going into um, these places, the context and the schema that you're uh, entering these locations with can dramatically alter the information that you interpret from these places. Thank you. Oh, we have some additional comments here. Um, with the other visual representations at uh, Hiroshima and yeah, in Nagasaki, thinking more about the monuments like the Children's Peace Monument or the fountain with the lights, I feel like the Pearl Harbor Mortal makes it the easiest to have the context beforehand without having to get it on your own through independent research school, et cetera. Pearl Harbor does a good job making sure everyone understands the context before going out, which makes the emotions felt while looking at it stronger compared to looking at the A dome. I will Thanks. say just uh, to reiterate, I, I, I do, when, when I've been through Pearl Harbor, I, I really appreciate that video that they have. Well, there's a video that they have that they have folks watch before you go on the ferry to get to the memorial. Um, unfortunately, things have shifted. So if you're in the right line, you get the video. If you're not in the right line, you just get a brief conversation. But even with the brief conversation, I I like that there isn't any specific blame placed on it. It's more just displaying the atrocities and of battle in the war um, as though I did not have that same experience when I went through <laughs> the other two museums. Um, uh, so I think, um, yeah, it's a, uh, and, and that's why I kind of refer back earlier talking about how important it is to have these facilitated dialogues uh, just because, and, and I think part of it's also a cultural difference uh, and maybe in, in just in the upbringing, because like, you know, we'll say that Nagasaki and Hiroshima Atomic Bomb Museums, they tend to be uh, very visual in, you know, the details and the impact and, and where the, what's in that, those museums, if it had to be, you know, a, a visiting exhibit here in the United States, there would be like so many like curtains for like censorship and or not censoring it but like making you conscientious of please be aware of you know all these you know how these images may impact you that kind of so there's there's a lot of uh, those um words to kind of caution you where i didn't come across that when <laughs> it was over there but i think it's just part of the culture like you have school groups it, it's part of like a pilgrimage like uh i don't know. I, I got kind of get the impression that like every year they visit one or the other museum or maybe both. Um, uh, I also noticed uh, the students treat it more. It's, it's an assignment because they would walk around with or <laughs> run around a little bit with their uh, one sheet paper where they're trying to find it's like a scavenger hunt, trying to find the answers to the questions that are being provided by their teacher. So um, it's 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 yeah. So it's it's a. I, I just try, we talk about perspectives and lived experiences and trying to understand the other side so that hopefully, you know, we can find some empathy and compassion and, and understanding. And I, um, yeah, so that's exactly what I'm just trying to do. Uh, and, and it's been a very enriching experience, uh, uh, just delving further into that. But anyways, David, I'll let you <laughs> take it away. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, I was hoping um, to allow people to, to talk like this. So thank you very much for everyone who 
uh, helped participate in the chat and um, commented on some of these uh, these questions. I was really excited to share this information with everyone. Um, I personally felt uh, very excited about this journey and sharing that journey with um, with people as well as what information was being communicated here. So I'm I'm really hoping that uh, this uh, this video and this talk story um, resonated with you in some way and that you you took away something. Um, at the very least. But uh, thank you again very much for, for coming. And I hope you guys have an excellent evening. And I'm hoping that we can continue discourse around these perspectives and you share this with others. Well, I just had to say thank you so much, David, for you know everything you've done here. Uh, beautiful job, just kind of, you know, I, I know it, it's not easy video editing and putting together basically uh, a documentary. Uh, I know you're modest and humble and would never acknowledge it as <laughs> that, and it's just a project. But if down the road at some point you become a famous doc filmmaker, I can say that it all started here. <laughs> so truly appreciate you opening up about your experiences, the lessons learned uh, to come to today's dialogue. Thank you for your kindness and leadership as we learn about unfortunately the tragic impact of nuclear bombs um last but not least thank you so much for our audience who's still with us uh, for today's webinar i really appreciate you all uh appreciate your interest in supporting joining us to learn about building a nuclear free world talk story thanks again everyone